Hey, welcome everybody. This is Sean Starry. I'm your host today of the Freedom Garden Club podcast show. And today we got a wonderful guest who's coming back on. Um, his name is Jason Longoria uh, of the United Party. Um, and we're going to be talking today about illegal immigration and border patrol. Hey, Jason, thank you for joining with us today. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm glad to be here. Not a problem. Uh, so far, we got three viewers today, so right off the bat. So that's a that's a good number. Um, and so we're going to be talking about immigration uh, and policies and border, illegal border crossings that are coming across America. And I kind of want to get your thought on that. Well, we know it's a problem. And it's been a problem for quite some time, particularly over the last three and a half years. And I think that there are some solutions that are not being looked at. I think people are, rather than looking at it objectively, they're looking at it subjectively. And that's where a lot of the debate's coming in. So I think with some of the things we're going to discuss today, we're going to come up with a good solution. And it's going to help a lot of other faucets and facets of life here in America. Uh, what do you, okay, so <clears throat> now uh, we know that the CBP one app was the creation of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Um, when they first took office, they got rid of a lot of the, the uh, a lot of the policies that Trump had put into place, the executive orders, they replaced it with a CBP one app. Now, this was an app that was basically in, uh, utilized with taxpayer money to pay the UN, to pay the NGOs, to traffic of these people across the border. Now, what would be the first thing, uh, I guess, what would be the first thing you would do uh, if you wanted to, I guess, a first step to fixing this problem? Well, the first step is to get the people gathered Right. I don't want to say things like round them up because that's not really what I mean. What I mean is we need to take them back to where they belong. They came over here legally. They don't have a right to be here and they're causing mayhem everywhere. And not all of these people want to be here. And we know that. So I want to make sure that we're careful about how we articulate our plan. But one of the very first things that I would do is I would tear down the wall because the wall is expensive. It clearly is not working. And I think that we are overlooking the obvious because let me just give you an example. If the Grand Canyon were 3000 miles long, how many people do you think would be crossing that to get into the United States? That's actually a good point. So rather than have a wall, we are going to take the prisons and bring them back into the state responsibility. We are going to end the privatization because that's just keeping our, our prisons full with a lot of people who don't deserve to be there. Right. And I think we can admit that in a, in a lot of different ways. Um, so the ones that do belong there are sitting around making burritos and watching TV and lifting weights and going out in the yard and smoking cigarettes. So how is that in any way, shape or form reforming these folks to come back into society? Now, I know some prisons have, you know, classes and stuff like that when they're getting ready to get out, but they're not really giving them any kind of tool to be successful. Right. So there's a couple of things we need to fix. One, we need to fix the way that they can become employed when they leave. Right. Not all of them are going to go into the same field. And there's very few fields that they can get into anyway because of their criminal history. So we got to work on that. Secondly, the ones that are in there for violent crimes, the ones that are in there for a long time and they're not coming back, we need to give them something to do to make them think about what they've done to the people that have, have put them in there, in essence, right? So if we take our prisons and we implement a project to take down the wall, to literally dig a 50 foot by 50 foot crevice between Mexico and the United States, all the way from Louisiana, all the way down through Tijuana. 
we now have a solution, right? Because it's gonna it's gonna solve two problems, right? One, the people are going to think twice about committing a crime because they know where they're gonna end up. Right. Second all these drug tunnels and all these tunnels they're using to smuggle people that we keep talking about. Once we dig it 50 feet deep, we're going to find those tunnels. Are we not? Yeah. Once we fill it with water, right? Because we're going to want to put some water in there. We've got alligators and we can use it for some other things like, you know, making some of that desert a little bit lusher than it is. But more importantly, it's to mitigate people, you know, thinking that they're just going to be able to run across the border and then get into the states and try and figure out how they're going to make their way doing whatever it is because when they come over here like that nine out of ten times they do not have good intent they just don't and as we've seen all across the news all these increases in crime and all these small communities and they don't have the the, the manpower to manage it so by first you know getting all these folks together putting them back where they belong they can then have an opportunity to come through the the proper channels to become a U.S. citizen. If they're coming here to be a U.S. citizen because they like the values of being an American, then we welcome you. But if you're coming over here to just fly under the radar, get away from another problem somewhere else and not participate in the communities and society, then those are not the kind of people we want here. So I think yeah. in my mind, if we reform the prison systems, and put them back to hard labor. It's like when you go into the military, right? You have no rights. Yep. So why do these people have rights? They don't have any rights. They can't vote. They can't make decisions. But I'll tell you what, if we take these folks and we put them to work, they're going to think long and hard about what they did because they're going to have plenty of time to do so by themselves, digging ditches and solving the problem of immigration and border security. Because in the end of the day, how many border patrol agents do you think you're going to need if you have a 50 foot ditch, 50 <laughs> feet deep or 3000 miles? Right. And then when we put some water in it, all these people that are smuggling people, we're going to figure out where those tunnels go real quick, aren't we? Because you're going to see water popping up <laughs> all over the place. So now we know where they're at. So if we really, truly want to solve problems, this is a solution to solving those problems. And I know some people may think that it's inhumane, but the fact of the matter is, is sometimes you have to make the hard decisions. And that's why I said we need to look at it objectively versus subjectively. Because once you start making each person's feelings part of the decision, you're never going to get anything done. Because as we know, you're never going to please everyone. But I think putting an approach like this, not only is it going to help our prisons like, you know, um, decrease in population, but it's also going to show anybody else who wants to commit a crime where they're going to wind up yeah. because we're going to make sure that people know that this is how we're going to manage our reform because you know what, they're going to be really happy to be done with that job. If you think about how much dirt that is to move roughly 3000 miles, 50 feet deep, 50 feet wide, that's a lot of dirt, <laughs> but you know, we can use those. We, we can find purpose for these materials all while solving the problem with the border patrol because we don't need a bunch of them, right? They can see pretty far from a tower or whatever. And right. we have the ports of entry. So if you really want to become a citizen, come to the port of entry. And if it's a, a need for asylum, then we have all the paperwork set up, filled out right there. We know where you're at. We know who you're with. We know where you're going. And we can help you. And we want to help you. But we only want the people that want to truly be a part of America and participate in our values our morals and our ethics. And I mean, I grew up in the, the suburbs outside of Chicago. Okay. And I lived downtown Chicago for a while too. So I have always been around every ethnicity, every race, and I've never had a problem with any of them. They're all great people, but they came here to make their lives better and participate as Americans in our society, in our culture and they brought some of theirs too. And we, we like all these things. So, but to solve the problem, that's the way to do it because that's going to happen quick and people are going to try it first. And you know what? They're going to be the warning bells for everybody else who tries and, and they're not going to succeed. Exactly. And, and the word's going to get out, you know, to those who are 
wanting to come across illegally in the future is they're going to be telling us that let ho oh, oh, dude that that there's there's three mi- or thirty th- or three thousand miles of a ditch that's fifty feet wide and fifty feet deep and it's you know say half filled with water and they got you know crocodiles or, or snappers in there <laughs> I mean I mean come on it, there's you're you're not going to be able to construct something and and be able to use that as land bridge because I'm sure they're going to have cameras everywhere monitoring that whole area as well. And they're going to have like maybe 10 people sitting in an office watching this shit going on. And I mean, what's the, what's the, what's the, what is the uh, percentage of success? Well, you can't dig tunnels. That's kind of out the window. Um, what else? Mm, well, let's see. Maybe I should come across the port of entry legally. Mm, that might be a better idea. Yeah, because nobody's going to be evil Knieveling it. I promise you that. <laughs> right. Put some like spring traps up on the on our side so they try to come across it. No. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, it, it's a gentle reminder mm-hmm. that this isn't the right way. Because exactly. the, the wall really intimidates people, right? They make it feel like somehow we're on this high horse, this high moral horse that we can put up a wall and we're just going to block everybody because we're America when really we're protecting our citizens. That's part of our federal responsibility to our citizens, right? Is to protect them. Exactly. And we don't know who's coming over and, and don't even get me started on the fentanyl problem, the, the human trafficking. I mean, it's going to make it really, really difficult for them to traffic from Mexico anywhere along our Southern border. Cause you're just not going to make it. Right. You're not going to be able to prepare enough that we're not going to see you preparing enough to stop you from doing it. Right. And I mean, the amount of money it costs to dig 75 feet down and a tunnel that's going to have to be two miles. I mean, the value is not there for them. And then this is also going to help with any kind of smuggling, right? There won't be a smuggling problem because you know what, you've got the four ports of entry right there on the, the Southern border. That's what you got. You're not going to go beyond that. And we're not doing this because we're assholes. We're doing this because you're not following the rules. We all have to follow the rules. And I really think that that reforming the prison system system to do this takes away the worry of how much tax money is going to be spent building this ditch. Right. And literally, we're not building it, we're digging it. So our biggest problem with this whole thing is going to be where do we put all the dirt? <laughs> well, let's see. Um I'm sure we can find a place for it. I'm pretty sure. I mean, so, they, could, you know I mean? they could they could bag it up. They could bag it up. They could, they could sell it and make the money off of that and then take that money and put it right back into the project. But see, one of the things that we discussed in our other podcast was the sense of accomplishment. Regardless of these people, whether they're 18 years old or 55 years old, everybody likes a sense of accomplishment. They'll right. figure out a case. Is it going to be a fun job? No, it's not. But what you did is what landed you here. And I can promise you, you're not going to do it again if you get out. Right. And this is going to help a lot with our court systems, because you know what? We cannot count on the courts and the justice system to do justice. They just want people in jail because it's money. So if we mitigate all that because people aren't committing crimes because they know there's a likely chance they're going to be on the border digging ditches. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally, where are you going to run? Where are you going to go? You're not running away, bud. You know what I mean? (laughs) And I mean, hard work. It's going to be hard work. I mean, they're not going to work, you know, six hours, eight hours. They're going to be working like 16 hours, like a double shift. Like, you know, get on with it. Like, we're not messing around. Like, you're here to pay a consequence for your action. Now, yep. you know, this, this is going to cause a lot of, of controversy because what about the guy that's in there for, you know, some mundane crime? And I say mundane because it's like you're caught peeing in a public park and now you're a sex offender and yada, 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 which is really unfair to you. But the judge throws the book at you. You do three years in prison. And those are the things that are going to cause the controversy because does this guy deserve to dig ditches for three years? Probably not. But with better communities and reform in our justice system and making sure that people know and understand the constitution, 
there's going to be a lot less people in the courtrooms. I agree. I agree. And, and we get back to the original premise of the Constitution, where if there is not a victim, then it is not a crime. That's right. That's right. Nobody was injured. Nothing was stolen, stolen and nothing was damaged. Right. Those are pretty simple rules, right? <laughs> don't don't kill anybody. <laughs> don't steal <laughs> shit. And don't break shit. Right. <laughs> Other than that, you know what? You're, you're pretty you're pretty all right. But, you know, this is why it's it's such a, a controversial subject. Right. Because everybody wants to put the feelings of those people that are going through all this traumatic, you know, temporary life change. But you know what? We, we all do. Yeah. People lose loved ones. People lose their jobs. They lose their girlfriends or boyfriends, maybe a child. You know, all kinds of tragedies happen all the time. They're not going to stop happening. So let's not let this become a tragedy that that stains the American people's flag of justice and liberty, freedom. Right. We don't want that. So we have to make and take drastic measures for drastic problems. And this is really a drastic problem. How many people have come across the border in the last three and a half years? Well, that's a good question. Um, I'm going to bring up a statistics. Um, this is this is a, uh, this is all coming from Google, you, and so we'll, we'll get some of these figures from Google here. Um, so, il, uh, so this is the illegal immigration and border patrol. Uh, okay, so since October two, 2019, the U.S. Custom and Border Patrol. Our border protection has recorded nearly 11 million border encounters. Now, this is just encounters of people that they've run into. Uh, this is roughly the same number of people as the population of North Carolina. So, how many asylum seekers in the U.S. Uh, in 2024? Uh, so, in FY 2024. Refugee uh, emissions have reached 100,034, of which more than 14,000 were welcomed by global refuge, making it the highest level of refuge resettlement uh, since 1995. So top countries' origins include refugees from Democratic Republic of Congo, Afghanistan, Syria, Venezuela, Burma, and Myanmar. So... And this is really another thing that's interesting is out of all of these countries here they're talking about, and most of them are actually listed as what we would, the United States government calls uh, actually uh, an enemy of the state uh, because they're put onto a terrorist watch list. So how many people cross the border each year? So this is a really, this is kind of a rough estimate, but the, the, you want to kind of figure a little bit higher than this. But the 1,951 mile, the U.S.-Mexico border is the busiest in the world. Each year, our southern border allows more than 300 million people, okay? So approximately 90 million cars and 4.3 million truck crossings. Now, how many immigrants that come into the U.S. each year by country? So, 2022, Mexico was at the top country of birth for immigrants who arrived in the last year with about 150,000 people. And in India, about 145,000. And in China, about 90,000 were the next largest source of immigrants. Now, Venezuela, Cuba, Brazil, Canada each had about 50,000 to 60,000 new immigrant arrivals. Okay, so there's <clears throat> between the illegal immigrants and the legal immigrants, um, you know, just in the legal legal side, we 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 have roughly, you know, uh, 50 for say for, you know, Canada, that's 50,000 people. OK, <clears throat> so we know uh, as far as the, the latest report that I've seen is we have roughly about 30 to 40 million illegals that have come across the border. Um, just like we saw earlier in, uh, at the very beginning of the podcast here, we could see those people at the Darien Pass um, that were being handled by the cartel uh, 
to driving them it's like a cattle drive basically driving them across that border so that number you know is, is i mean <clears throat> right now you know there's a lot of them we don't even know who we don't even know uh the exact estimate or the exact number of how many of them out of all of those people are the most dangerous people right uh how many of them are actually on the u.s terror watch list that are in our country right we just know about the ones that the border patrol has caught but we don't know about the ones that have already made it into this country so with that being said if we now let's just Let's just go back a quick sec. You said that there was about 14,000 people on the terror watch list that they know are here. Yes. So I have a really quick question. Why is this list not being pushed out to every police department, every media outlet and available to the public so that we can start recognizing who these people are before they do something terrible. Like if we know why is the government not using the citizens to help weed out these people? I mean, everybody's already scared. Everybody's already worried about it. They've got communities that are falling apart, you know, and, and let's just, let's just give everything the benefit of the doubt. Okay. So you hear about the Colorado situation with the Venezuelans down there and taking over the apartment complexes. Now, this is a very serious situation. They made it seem like it was, you know, this huge complex, regardless if it's huge or if it's one building or not, it's a problem. Now, if we know that these people exist there, why is our National Guard not going in there and clearing this stuff out? I mean, that is the purpose of the National Guard. They're at the state's disposal. These are not U.S. citizens. These are illegal immigrants. And as much as I, I really hate the term rounding them up because it just sounds like they're cattle, but they're people. I get that. But they're not meant to be here. We know that they're they're committing criminal activities. Yep. And I've seen the photos. I mean, I lived in Denver and in Colorado for a while. So when I got friends that send me pictures of these areas or friends that say, hey, I'm not going to Aurora. And I used to work for Raytheon in Aurora. So I've, dri I've driven through there several times. And, you know, there's always been illegal immigrants. Um, look at any service industry. Look at any construction industry. Yep. Right? But they're here doing a job. They are taking care of their families. And, you know, citizenship's not an easy thing to get. So I want people to understand that I respect the people that are over here illegally trying to find a way to build a new life here in America, mm -hmm. enjoy the American culture, and we're going to work on getting their immigration done. We're going to work on getting them green cards and, and legitimizing them so that they can actually participate in society and they don't have to hide all the time, right? We are a melting pot, okay? We came from everywhere here. The only indigenous people here are the Indians, and we were terrible to them. We were absolutely awful. Yeah. But we have to draw the line somewhere. And if we know that these things are happening, just like in New York with those police officers, they were spitting on them. They were trying to attack them in the train station. Why is our National Guard not going out, scooping these guys up, taking them down to the border and processing them all back? Fingerprints, DNA, all that stuff so that we know after we get done building this ditch that they have to <laughs> Through the port of entry like we already know it's a no-go so they're not going to try and i hate to sound so uncaring about it but we do not want to take the problems of others other countries criminal habits and then just push them off into the united states because it's destroying our communities we need to do something to rebuild our communities and bringing in 11 plus million illegals that we are aware of is not, is not the solution. Right. And we're, we're seeing that everywhere, but nobody's doing anything like right. it's all lip service. Like we're coming up with solutions that we can implement like day one, like get ready for it. Because I'm telling you, when we take over office and we put this new administration in some of the very first things that we're going to do is start repairing America. 
right? Solving the problems of America, helping the American people, everybody on the outside, y'all were taking a break. America needs to heal, you know? Exactly. You can't keep using the world and trying to tell everybody what's right and what's wrong when we don't even know what's right or wrong at home. So the start is going to be reforming the prison system, coming up with a much better solution to border patrol. I think the ditch is a great idea. Yep. We don't have to worry about paying for it, right? Because the tax dollars pay for these people to sit in prison, lift weights, watch TV, fight amongst themselves, smoke cigarettes and trade food like that is not reform. So exactly. we don't have to worry about a huge cost, right? The cost is actually going to increase once people stop committing more crimes, right? Because then we have to start paying for labor. And, you know, I mean, we, we want the crime to go down. We want the jails to empty out. And then these people are going to be the example of why you don't commit crimes. Because some of these crimes, the death sentence is just too easy. It's an easy way out. No, yeah. we're not doing that. You're going to pay. You're going to pay hard and long for what you've done. That's it. That would be nice to see uh, uh, crooked politicians down there digging the ditches. I think we get more. I think we get our money out of it. Uh, you know. Um, you know, that's. Uh, <laughs> you know, it. it, it and I guess, you know, we would have to have some kind of a system put into place for other, you know, prisons and other states to be able to participate in some kind of an exchange where we could send them, you know, say, say here in Illinois or something, we could send the prisoners down there and they could, you know, have some kind of a contract where they do, you know, they have a place to stay, but they would definitely uh, be down there for a length of time, say for a couple of years, kind of like a, like a military tour, you know, they, they would go down, do a tour, digging ditches for say a couple of years. And then when they're done, they can, they can come back up to the, the prison up here and, and other states can do the same thing. You know, I mean, we've got, and, and again, like you're saying too, we need to uh, get our court systems back to the constitutional courts we need to get a lot of these people that are in prison for a crime that where there is no uh, no injured party at all. Uh, like, you know, something as simple as, you know, oh, I didn't have insurance on my car or I didn't, you know, I, you know, I don't have a driver's license and they just, they just jail them, you know, they just throw them in jail. Or how about... You know, um, some dude that couldn't pay his child support this month, or maybe he's a little bit late. Well, and, you know, they're throwing these guys into, into prisons, right? <laughs> we do away with all of that, and we just get down to do the the constitutional basics. You know, if you injure somebody, if you hurt somebody, you do did serious damage, property, um, a property damage. You know, then yes, those are the people that we need to, you know. Uh, they should be in prison and they should be doing something, you know, productive with their time rather than just sitting there like you're saying. Well, yeah, because they're not they're not getting any reform. No, and half no. Of people that uh, that are not going to take any of the coursework. They're there to just do their time. You know, they're going to get out and go right back to the same thing. Exactly. And, 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 and one of the other things, go ahead. I'm sorry. No. And, and, and you know, one of the one of the things I used to teach in, you know, in a, a Bible study for men was, <clears throat> I would often tell them that, you know, a man's life, uh, he should be physically active. He should be physically building something, right? Um, and, you know, we're, we're as men, we're not built to just sit around. And do nothing. Uh, that's not. I mean, our <clears throat> we we cannot be mentally healthy if we're just sitting around. And I think that's a part of a lot of the mental health problems with men and in the United States today is they're not active. They're not. They're not. You know, out doing something, or out building something, and out being creative. Um, you know, using their bodies you know, like they're supposed to. 
and they're just you know the body starts to spoil the mind starts to spoil and that's just not not a healthy approach and i think digging ditches is, is you know is a really good thing because there's they're you know they're going to live longer number one because they're physically active so and number two it's also going to help with their mental health and well-being because they're like like you were saying before they're they're doing something they're learning they're a new skill skill trade right um they're building something and so they can take some pride in and the work and they're learning this so when they get out of prison and they go into the in the labor workforce they can they learn to take pride in into their work it doesn't matter what kind of work it is but they have that sense of accomplishment yeah yeah, you're absolutely right about that. And, you know, one of the things that we have to also keep in mind is we are not trying to break people. But when you commit a crime, there's a consequence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so some of these guys that are going to be in there for 8, 10, 12, 15, 25, 30 years, like there's not going to be any room for advancement, right? Anybody who's on a life sentence this is just going to be a hard one for you. And you're here for a reason, you yeah. know, if you're there for, and I hate, I hate this crime altogether, but if you're there for, you know, uh, sexually assaulting anybody, especially a minor, you will never get off that chain gang. You will always be digging ditches, but those that are in there for, let's just say they're in there for selling cocaine. Right. And then they say, well, where was the harm? Well, the harm was in the people that died from this that you don't even know about because the amount they had was enough to distribute to a thousand people. Somebody yeah. got sick. Somebody did something wrong. Somebody got hurt. Somewhere down the line, you don't sell a kilo of cocaine and nobody getting hurt. Right? So exactly. your intent is to hurt somebody. You know that this is a poison. You know that people can overdose on it. And you're just looking at counting the dollars. So that person is going to be on that chain gang. Now, now listen, if they're going to be there for eight years, then they have an opportunity to work into working on operating heavy machinery, right? Because, you know, we got to be realistic about it. It's it wasn't 3000 miles. It's 1200 miles, but 50 feet deep. That's a long way down. There's not going to be shovel all the way, a lot of the way and then on and off again. But, you know, we're going to need these guys to run big machinery. And then they can be certified while they're in prison rather than getting a sex change. They can become a certified <laughs> crane operator or whatever, right? Because we're helping their mental health. We're helping them overcome their crime, making them pay the price for it. And yep. then we're sending them off with an, with an actual trade that's going to make them decent money so they don't return to crime, right? Because they're going to have a whole different perspective on life when they get done digging for two or three years. Exactly. And think about road construction, right? Building bridges. So yeah, it's hard labor and it's manual labor and we're doing it intentionally, but we're also intentionally giving you a skill that you're going to be able to utilize when you walk out of this prison and you're going to be reformed because you had the time to think about what you did. I, I agree a hundred percent. I agree a hundred percent. You know, and that's the thing is, you know, most of the crime, uh, in the United States is, is between the ages of 13 and 35. And I think by having something like this in place, you know, um, you know, the, the up, upcoming generations, they're going to, they're going to know because people are going to tell them, you know, uh, folks that are a little bit older than them or, or their parents or grandparents are going to say, you know, well, you know, if, if you're out there slinging dope, then this is, this is what's going to happen, you know. Uh, this is not something that's fictionalized or, you know, some hearsay. Everybody knows this, you know. Everybody has seen, you know, the, the media covering this, you know. There's, you know, now with social media, I mean, there's no way. You, it's it's going to be unavoidable. But that person's going to look at it and go, well, yeah, maybe, maybe it's not – it's such a good idea you know maybe i should think about uh, some more 
you know, better things, you know. Um, Knowledge. You know. Great school. Yeah, like maybe go to school, stay in school, get your education, you know, focus on, you know, what you want to do for a career. Um, you know, maybe focus on one day I want to be a father. Or maybe I want to be a better father than my dad was, you know. Um, how, how am I going to accomplish this, right? So, set some goals, you know. Um, you know. So I think the prison, the whole prison reform, that is such a great idea because then we get away from that privatization where, you know, these corporations are making billions of dollars, if not trillions of dollars off the back of the labor of, of, of us. Where we could be taking, you know, control of this and say, well, okay, uh, we're probably, and, and more than likely, we're going to have a better food for them. We're going to have better conditions than a lot of these privatized prison systems to begin with because, yes. you know, some of them are in such dismal conditions to begin with. And, you know, prisoners could be out there, you know, planting gardens, right? They could be building big gardens. They could be, you know, raised, growing food and feed, learning how to grow food and, and, and have a new skill set right there. And they could be, you know, sell that a portion of that food into the community and that money comes back into the prison and so it kind of self-sustaining you know almost and it's, and it's where they come together like a community you know well yeah that and and what it also has to do is make sure the community is not going to be in fear of people being released from prison right yeah. So exactly. if they come back out of prison, let's just say they're in there for eight years, mm -hmm. they were digging ditches for three, they were gardening for three, they were, you know, doing something else, you know, taking further education classes, GED, so on and so forth. You know, so when they come out, like I said, they're going to have a whole different perspective on life. Yeah. And the ones that are going in, they went into it knowing what the consequences were going to be because we're very clear about that. So one, another great example would be the tornado that just hit North Carolina. If we could have sent down 25,000 prisoners, we have the technology to, to watch them. Right. You know, and, and again, this is kind of like something people might think is cruel, but you know, I mean, when you're training a dog, you put that little collar on there and you're like, ah, you know, you can give them a little ding first, a little vibrate but they keep going outside that perimeter, they're going to get a shock. You know what I mean? And you have to be very, very clear about these things. I know it's embarrassing, but you know what you did? You Exactly. You know what you did. You know why you're here. But we could have gone. We could have taken all that debris, got everything out of the way, loaded it up on trucks, take it out to a field somewhere, whatever we had to do to get it out of the way and start rebuilding. Again, giving these guys tools to be successful when they get done, helping the community that has, you know, pretty much blacklisted them because of their prison sentences and you know that helps reintegrate them into the communities right because not all these people are bad people right, right. but there are people that aren't in prison that are bad people so yeah. you know what i'm saying when you do it objectively you, you're giving everybody a chance right whether you're an illegal immigrant a prisoner or somebody that's just in our society you're giving them the opportunity to make the choice Right. You can try and jump across. We're all going to film it. It's going to be on, on TikTok. I promise you. Um, or you can come through the port of entry. Uh, you know, you're going to try and commit a crime and you're going to get caught and then you know where you're going to go. So you remember C-SPAN where you could watch the floor of the Senate in the House? Oh, right. Right. So we're going to have C-SPAN Channel 20 and that's going to be watching people dig in the ditch on the border. 24-7. <laughs> you know, you're going to see them working. And you're going to see exactly how this reform plan is going to come to fruition because you're going to physically get to see what's happening. So when your kid does something really stupid, like let's just say he he steals the car to go pick up his girlfriend because he's just madly in love for the first time. You can have him sit down for two hours and watch these guys building the, or digging this ditch and then ask him if he's going to steal that car again. I promise you he's going to say no. You know, so yeah. it, it's going to serve the community and a, and a plethora of ways it's going to make people feel safer it's going to make it seem like we're not so intimidating because we're not telling you not to do it we're just saying that the likelihood of you making it is less than one percent 
It's I mean, if I you can. do make it, maybe we should give you a high five. I mean, that's a lot of work to do, to climb over. A 50, I mean, you watch the Indiana Jones movie, right? They tried throwing oh, yeah. stuff, off, getting a rope bridge. That's a long way, 50 feet to hold yourself up. No, <laughs> that's real hard, especially without somebody from Border Patrol seeing you. You know, now they just got two dudes in a truck. They just drive up and down that side. You know, like a couple other dudes they meet up with, have some coffee and go their ways. And, you know, I mean, so right. now we don't need as many Border Patrol agents. And again, all of this, so all of this really turns into how are we making everything better? Well, we've stopped illegal immigration. We've stopped trafficking. We've stopped human trafficking, at least from that border. You can only get in through a port, a port of entry. Um, people are committing less crimes because they see the consequences they're going to pay for the crime they commit. And at the end of it, man, we're going to have a lot of people that are going to get reformed to the point where it's like our prisons are going to be rarely filled, rarely, you know, and even those that commit, you know, financial crimes, they are, are not, you know, impervious to digging ditches because <laughs> them bitches will be down there too, you know, because we got to lead by example. And you know what? And then here's the thing. The beauty of it is we have so many prisons, right? So many facilities that we can now transition into something else. We can use that property to make it a little bit more um, pleasant to be in your area. You know, yeah. if you've got a prison in your area, like down here where I'm at here in Georgia, there's a prison where people get murdered once a week. These guys are bad. And you know what? Guess what? Lots of ditches to be dug. You know, it's going to change yeah. attitude quick. And yeah, I really think that murder rate will just kind of fall yeah. right off and it'll plummet and then what's what's going to happen when nobody wants to join a gang anymore because they know the consequences now mm -hmm. they know what's going to happen so you're going to take the rap for your buddy for whatever dumb thing you're doing and you're going to spend five years on the chain gang because guess what there's no more getting out for good time they do get enough for good time because we don't have enough room for them <laughs> so there's no getting out with, for with good behavior if the judge sentences you to 25 years, you're going to do 25 years. Yeah, That's it. 25 years. So, you know, think long and hard about what you're going to do. And if we're in a constitutional court, there isn't going to be this huge variance of this guy who did X got 10 years and this guy who did X in Utah got 25 years. Right. It's going to kind of make it, you know, it, here's here's the baseline. Here's what the maximum sentences are. You know, you're trying to double them all up. And then this whole concurrent sentencing thing. So you got five years for this, five years for this, and five years for this. That's 15 years accumulatively. But since we're going to let them run in parallel, you're only going to do two and a half years. So now it's like you have incentive to commit a crime because you can do 15 year sentence in two and a half years because they let you let them run in parallel. No, no, you're, you're trying to perpetuate crime by making it to the victim. They got 15 years, but to the prisoner, you'll be out in two and a half. Just take it. Right. So, you know, all, all of this bullshit has got to stop. And why do why do we think our judges feel like they are untouchable? Because they spend their entire day, day in, day out, punishing people. Well, they're human beings, too, and they have bad days. And that bad day is not a day you want to be in court. It's not going to be the guy in front of you who wants to argue with the judge knowing that you're next because you're going to pay for it. <clears throat> yeah. Right. So, and, you know, it, it, it just would, doesn't it, have to be that way. It would make the it would make a lot of the court process a lot simpler, a lot easier and a lot more fair. Well, and that's what justice is, right? Why? Why is Lady Justice blind? Because she's not supposed to see who she's, you know, judging, right? Because when you see a person, you are judging them. They got long hair. They got tattoos. They got purple hair. Maybe they're homosexuals or maybe they're transgenders. You don't know if you're blind. You hear a voice. You know, it's a man or a woman. That's all you know. Yep. But when they can see you and they see your attitude and your body language and they start formulating their judgment based on those things, 
that's that's not very constitutional, is it? That's you using your opinion, which you're supposed to be unbiased, and you're blatantly showing me that you're not. Exactly. Exactly. And and if they have, you know, <clears throat> you know, then that's another thing too. It would actually prevent a lot of uh, judge opinions. You know, we go right down to de facto point is okay. Well, let's say you, you you committed a capital murder. Well, capital murder, you know, is say the the minimum is twenty five years and maximum is life. <laughs> and you know, and they would leave it up to the jury to decide if it's going to be twenty five years, if it's going to be thirty five, forty five, or or max. You know, the jury should be the one making that decision, not the judges themselves. The judge is more like a referee in the courtroom. I said that's all they're supposed to do is referee. Mm -hmm. um, they're not supposed to be given opinions and the only ones that are really allowed to give opinions, which is in the Supreme court, you know, they, their, their job is really simple. It's just to, you know, take whatever law that, you know, say, say state of Illinois came up with a law like they just did recently a couple of years ago. And it's kind of gone into effect now, but they, they got rid of the cash bail. So, the case gets taken to the Supreme Court and they look at it and they go, okay, we have to weigh this against the Constitution. Is this con this law constitutional or not? Yes or no? It's a very simple, you know, it, it doesn't have to be this five-page opinion and why I think this, 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 this. No. Is it constitutional? Yes or no? I mean, it is, it's really in the most simplistic terms, but the way the system is, is set up and designed now is all it's, it's all it's it's all set for and built around the idea of making money it's not about justice it's about how much money can i get off a poor prisoner you know and how much money do i get as a judge who's not an elected by the way who is just appointed okay <clears throat> and, and i i know you and i've had this discussion before but you, your, what I want to get to know is what what your thoughts are as far as appointed judges. Should we go back, or should we just get rid of appointed judges and just go with the citizens just electing the judges who they want to be a judge in their say their town or their county or state? So, so the first first, let's help people understand what the Supreme Court is. So in, in this particular instance, when you're talking about the law in Illinois that they passed a no cash bail, and then it went to the Supreme Court, it went to the, the Illinois State Supreme Court. Mm. It didn't go to the United States Congress Supreme Court. It just went to the Illinois Supreme Court. That's why they didn't have any problems with it. So the other thing that we have to understand is that when a judge is appointed, that makes him an administrative adjudicator. He's not a judge. He's an administrative adjudicator. And they did that because then they don't have to be bonded. So they created all these laws in the state constitutions that stop the judges from having to be bonded. Right. And then they started judicial immunity and they basically are just wordsmithing everything. So people feel like they have no way out. So that's wrong. Um, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. If we go back to constitutional courts, that means that we're working within common law. And we also know that courts today are administrative courts that's why you have maritime admiralty law and criminal court and then you have courts of equity in civil court and the the problem with that is is it becomes based on doctrines with a bunch of ambiguity in them where they have experts from three letter you know organizations defining the rules and laws and statutes and how they're to be interpreted that's problematic in so many ways because these people are not elected officials. They're just bureaucrats. They're not lawmakers, but yet they're defining the rule of law. So a judge knows how to rule in a particular scenario. So if we take all that away and go back to the constitution, then it comes back down to those three things, right? Did you kill somebody? Did you hurt somebody? Did you damage their property? Did you steal from them? Right? They're, they're, they're very basic laws. And when they see the reform in the judicial system, along with the prison system, I'm telling you, those buildings are going to be pretty empty. We're not going to need a, 
a community of 15,000 people to have 14 different judges. It's just not going to be necessary. They'll have to have a family court judge or a civil judge, and they'll have to have a criminal judge. And sometimes they'll have to, you know, swap out when the other one has a day off, but they're not going to need these giant courthouses with 12 courtrooms because people are going to start looking into their own future because, you know, what, we're creating value in our community, in our citizens, and providing them with a tool set that does nothing more than give them opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And if we go all the way back to our educational podcast, it starts with the children, it starts with accomplishment, and we start taking these basic fundamentals and building them into our society, it's going to solve itself as far as the criminal problems that we see. Not all of them, there will always be bad guys. There mm -hmm. will always be bad guys. So there's just gonna be a, a lot less of them with the consequences and the stakes being so high. There won't be a value to it because your time is going to outweigh the value of what you're trying to pull off. Yeah. Right. And that's not how it is today. So no cash bail failed on Illinois. Their jails are empty. So now what they've done is they have criminalized everything. So now everything is a jailable offense. If you're driving on a suspended license, a license, which Illinois rarely sends you anything telling you it's suspended, especially for child support, yep. and you get pulled over, you're going to jail. And since there's no cash bail, you're sitting until you see a judge, till your arraignment. If you are late on your child support, they put a warrant out for your arrest that says no bond. They can hold you up to 45 days before seeing you, you can ask for a speedy trial, but you're just shooting yourself in the foot because the judge is just going to turn around and say 60 days or six months or whatever he decides. Yeah. So, you know, now you have to be very cautious and you have to now figure out what's going on with you at all times because Illinois is not there to help you. They're there to take your money. They're there to jail you for every possible thing. And I'm telling you this from personal experience because even though I'm running for president, I have been to jail 19 times in the last six years over this child custody. 19 times. And I can't even tell you how many times I've been arrested. And every offense, one of you two are going to jail, and it's always me. Even when they took her to jail, they took me too. Because they didn't want me getting my kids. Because they knew if, if they didn't take me, I'd get the kids and she'd lose them. Well, her family's got a business there for 90 years. Yep. And they told me I'd never win. No matter how much money I threw at it, no matter what attorney I got, they would never allow that name to be tarnished. And so far, it has been 100% true. I have always paid the consequences for that. I lost my career. I lost my family. I lost my house. I lost all of it because I finally just had to pick up and say, Illinois is too much. They are the most socialist run state in our entire nation. And that's and, and I can attest to that. That's just very true. <laughs> you know, um, when I worked as a as an armed security officer uh, for state and for contracts in, in the state of Illinois, you know, there's there's a lot. <clears throat> it, it is almost mafiasa like. Um, the system, the way the system is set up, because, you know, they, you can, like in this state here, like, I'll give you a good example. If you, uh, if you go to a jail for a financial crime, say uh, over a thousand dollars, that's, that's automatic guarantee. You're going to do two years. Okay. That's, that's without any given. But if you commit a heinous crime, like molesting a child, uh, let's say on say three offenses, right? Uh, they'll do like plea bargaining and they'll bargain it down, and, and you'll be out in three and a half years. So, the big thing about the state in, in general is it's a priority of which crimes are more heinous than the others, and that's skewed, it's, it's almost like it's upside down. <clears throat> and even with, like for example, like the the the, uh, the foster care system. The foster care system is a system for profit. It's not actually about 
let's take care of the kids. Let's take this, you know, make sure that they get what they need. They, the courts here, they, they outsource all of the work to corporations. And that's been very damaging. To Do you know why? Of, well, it's all for profit. It's all, all about, it's all about the money. So let me clue you in on something because I've had six DCFS investigations, which is the Department of Child and Family Services in Illinois. Right. So they have a budget of about, and I may be wrong about this, but it's somewhere between 49 million and $150 million for lawsuits that they predict are going to happen to them. So the way they mitigated that was DCFS will come out and do the initial investigation. They will contact you for up to the first 30 days. And then they hand it off to a private company that cannot be sued because they were giving them the recommendations and that company now is there to carry out those recommendations. So they've shielded themselves from any of the lost children, from any of the damages they've caused the families because they literally go in there and they do the investigation, then they do the analysis, then they come up with a plan and then they source out the plan. So rather than taking that $150 million and paying the people that they hurt, they now pay a private company to hurt those people because there's no recourse. Because you can sue a state agency a whole lot easier than you can sue a private industry. That's true. That's very true. And because once you get into that system, they automatically assume you don't know what your rights are because they took them away from you the moment you sign that paper when they come in and do that investigation. They're like, all right, you need to sign the same. We're here, blah, 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 blah. When really what you're doing is you're signing over your parental rights to their decision. And people don't know that. It doesn't even say that in there. It's just kind of like an assumption. So when they do come to take your kids, they're going to say that you signed this paper, that they came over and they were allowed to do the investigation. And you think you're doing yourself a solid because you're agreeing with them. You're being cooperative when really you're signing away your ability to say no. Yep. And that's how they get the court order from the judge. And once you get the court order from the judge, your rights are what he gives you. And he'll tell you that. He'll be very clear that you have no rights until he gives them to you or she. So... The way that this all ties into our criminal reform, our illegal immigration problem, because, you know, even though we're talking about the way that this happens to families, this also happens to these illegal immigrants and their children. They take their children. They have no idea where they're at. Yep. Right. So bringing it to your foster care system, the Department of Child and Family Services, our corrupt court systems, these things need to be fixed. And since the courts and the government is not reliable enough or honest enough to make these changes because they are too, excuse me, they are too profitable, then we, the people need to take that away by simply not committing crimes, by not agreeing to illegal search and seizures, by not allowing three letter acronyms to come in and bully our rights away from us, by forcing us into signing papers, threatening us with legal action. When, if we go back to the constitution, if there's nobody killed, nothing stolen and nothing damaged, there there's there's, there's no, no crime here. right exactly right and i think you know well this is what i do know uh, as this stands right now there's 865,000 illegal immigrant children that are missing here in the u.s and i know we've all seen the videos of these corporate handlers uh escorting these children they're not parents to this to these children but they're escorting these these groups of groups of children through airports and fly them out to uh different locations throughout the throughout the country and you know, this kind of brings up, it kind of reminds me uh, of an incident that happened in 1920 where they did the same thing with the, the, the immigration. Uh, they were taking the children and they were putting them on trains and they were shipping them all across the country to all of these orphanages. And New York City was was a very big, as a the, the vast majority of the number of the children that were taken by the government at that time 
Uh, the vast majority of them came from New York, but a lot of them got shipped out to the West. And a lot of orphanages, I mean, even to this day, you know, a lot of those orphanages are still there, but they're not are no functional or operational, but it's a reminder of, you know, we still have this problem today. It may not be by train, but the system is still in place and the system needs to go away. We, uh, you know, we need to, as Americans, we need to come together and rectify the situation. Otherwise, uh, our future generation is going to be uh, having to pay the same price that's been going on for the last 100 years. So, you're absolutely right about that. And a little bit more on that topic. Actually, around that time period, it was a little bit sooner than than 1920. But at the end of World War One. There was 2 million enlisted soldiers and 2 million volunteer soldiers um, that didn't come back from that war. Mm -hmm. So what they did was they opened up a bunch of orphanages and it was actually a guy from Germany who ran them all. And ironically enough, next to almost every single orphanage was an insane asylum. So if the mother did not participate in allowing them to take the child from her, they deemed her crazy, put her in the insane asylum and took the children now what they did was they raised all of these children over the next two decades and then they took and they shipped these children out to different locations to start communities based on the teachings of the orphanage so if they yep. didn't like the way a town was going they would flood it with all these orphans that were 18 and moving out and moving on and they'd set up these little you know halfway houses there because they were able to change the community dynamic by flooding it with all of these orphans that they had taken from these mothers that they put in insane asylums. And then on top of that, they were conducting a lot of illegal experimentations on the female population in the insane asylums. Kind of funny how that all them numbers add up, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, we, we've had problems with government overreach for so long that, you know, part of the, so, so there's two things. One, I'm representing my own personal opinions. I'm representing my views on policies and solutions that I'm going to invoke when I'm president. This in no way, shape or form is the view of the United Party. As I said previous to this, we're going to build the view of the United Party using the barbecue run and these doctrines from all the questions and data aggregation to determine what the, the direction of the United Party is. But I wanna make sure that people understand that there's two distinctions here. One, my views on my presidency running as somebody from the United Party does not mean that they're going to agree with all of my views and they're not the views of the United Party. Yeah, you know, and that's the thing is that there's a lot of other parties that have been, come, just have been completely disenfranchised. And, you know, I, as an independent myself, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't like the, I don't like the idea that I, I, I only have two major parties only to, you know, to choose. Right. And the idea that I have to vote Republican or Democrat, you know, cause I know that if I vote for an, in, you know, for the independent party, which I can, and I, I, I'm certainly free to do so, but the problem is, is that these other platforms are not getting, they're not, a lot of folks don't even know who these people are to begin with, right? Um, because the last time we saw any of those parties on the same platform as the Republicans, and Democrats, that was in 1979. That was the last time. Um, after that, they would be uh, at a different location at a different time on C-SPAN 2, C-SPAN 3, and most people don't even watch C-SPAN 2 or C-SPAN 3, right? <laughs> Whereas the Democrat and the president, a uh, Democrat and a, and a Republican party, they're they're on the, you know, the, the mainstream media, uh, you know, CNN or Fox News or whatever. They get the prime time channel. And I, and I know the vast majority of my followers, you know, feel the same way is, 
And, you know, we're, we're tired of the far left extremism. We're tired of the far right extremism. We are we're coming into um, a, a, a point or a period of where we're trying to come to the center. And unfortunately, for the Democrats and the Republicans, it's really hard to look at either one of them and say, OK, we're going to come to the middle. We want to come to the middle, right? And so with this election right now, you know, we, we feel compelled to, well, we know the Democrat Party is, is completely off the rails and sane. So we're only left with one option, which is the Republican Party at this point. But moving forward in the future, you know, uh, I can say this for only for myself, but I'm looking for a party that is going to be right down the center where we're going to have people from both sides coming together in one party where we can say, you know, okay, we're going to focus on common sense solutions rather than, uh, you know, uh, having a party that's just going to sit there and just accuse the other party of whatever. We want to see solutions and we want to see single issue bills. They vote on single issue bills and they just, you know, if they're going to have a debate about the single issue bills, bills that's fine but focus on the solutions rather than so much on the problem because there's a million solutions for every single problem why aren't the republicans and the democrats just focus on just the solutions um and it only seems like right now the republicans are kind of more focused on the solutions which which i see a lot of what trump is trying to accomplish now and if anybody knows who Trump really is, Trump has always been an independent guy. He's always, I mean, in fact, he ran for president in 1994 and he ran under the independent platform and he got no views. In fact, he was on C-SPAN 3. Most people didn't even know about this. And during the, that, that time of the elections, I voted for him back then in 1994, but he didn't garner you know the the uh the votes like he did in 2016 but he had to go on the republican platform just so that he would be on primetime tv he would get the votes that he needed and i know this is going to be his last four years um and i know he's going to do a great job but moving past that i want to you know I'm, I'm looking for something else i'm looking uh, you know, for something that's down in the middle of the road where everybody's coming together, everybody can be, everybody's voices can be heard, not, uh, you know, ignored, right? Like I can go on Twitter uh, and or on X, and and I noticed this too. You know, I go on X and I'm and I would send a message to a politician and I'd say, well, how about if we you know focus on the solution or whatever? And you know something, there's never a reply. They, it, it's, it's, I can almost guarantee you, none of these politicians ever re respond or never reply. It's just nothing more than just clickbaits, right? And it's really hard to find uh, a politician nowadays that you can go talk to, whether it's on social media, whether it's in person. Um, and, and I think I could speak for a lot of people. We would love to be able to sit down with somebody in a different party who, know would have a large following where we can go to where there would be you know spend more time actually listening to people and then going to dc and then you know coming up with solutions and passing uh, bills that were focused on the american people and um and i guess m my question would be is how would you approach this uh, you know, uh, as a United Party uh, running for president, and what would be, um, what would be your big um, priority as far as, you know, um, large American public, you know, and getting their consensus on, on things. The barbecue run to start with which is the whole purpose of it, right? Is to get mm. these opinions. But let's let's just take this from, from a pretty stout standpoint. 
the reason that you don't get responses from politicians is because they need something to run on. So if you if you solve the problems, what do they have to run on? Because if you notice over the last eight elections, the policies have pretty much been the same, right? Like right. abortion is always a huge policy. It's a huge policy, right? But what I plan to do is solve these problems. All the policies that are out there now, we put them to bed. We solve them. So immigration, which is what we talked about today mostly, problem solved, right? Not everybody's going to agree with it. A lot of people are going to be pissed. But right. guess what? Somebody has to make the hard choice. I'm going to make those hard choices, right? Prison reform. Somebody's got to make that hard choice. I'm going to make those choices. Abortion. We're going to make those choices. And I'm not saying I'm because that is definitely a we situation, but it needs to be put to bed. It needs to be put to bed. Yep. That's simple. And the same thing with the, you know, the healthcare issues, the education issues, we are going to put these issues to bed so that they are not topics of discussion during a debate. Because there's going to be plenty of new things that we're going to have to figure out policy for that are worth the debate than the same things we keep rehashing over and over and over again. And let's not forget all these policies that we rehash over and over again are what continually divide our nation more and more and more. And the, the more elections it goes through, the more extreme the responses are. So it's further separating the communities, the people by red and blue. It's never going to go away because everything's just a, a temporary band aid until the next election cycle. Right. So <laughs> politician doesn't respond to you because if you solve the problems that he's going to run his ticket on. He's not going to want that help. So if we at the federal level start taking care of these policies now. Right. So immigration, prison reform, judicial reform, education reform. And we start putting these things into motion. Then at our next debate, you know, what we're going to talk about how great these things, these things are working out. It's not whether or not I made the policy or not. We're going to have experts that help us figure out all the details. But right. from a high level, these are the things that we're going to solve. Once we solve these things, what are these guys arguing about? What, what is the problem? Guys, pull it together. We don't have an immigration problem anymore. We don't have drug smuggling problem. We don't have as big of a human trafficking problem. We're always going to have problems. But if we make the consequences severe, not by, you know, how many years you're going to spend in prison, but what you're going to be doing while you're there, you're going to think twice. If we teach people and arm them with knowledge and information and the tools to be successful because we find out what they're good at at a very young age, we are going to have all kinds of successful people running around the country. Period. And then when people want to come over here, they're going to go through the ports of entry. They're going to come over here because they want to be American because it's a badass place to be. <laughs> That's exactly. simple, right? So we solve these problems. I will make the hard decisions. I will be the asshole. I'm only there for four years, eight years, if they like what I'm doing. And if I make it through those eight years, I'm thrown in the towel. I'm, I've done my do. I've done my duty to my country. That's that's the whole purpose of this. I'm not making this a lifelong political thing. Why do you think I'm not trying to be a senator or a congressman? No, you know what? I'm not climbing that ladder. I'm going straight to the top. I'm going to solve the problems and we're going to fix this damn country. I, you know, I like that. I like that. And I know I thought I can almost say, you know, the vast majority of Americans, we're not looking for career politicians. We're looking for somebody who is a blue collar type of person. I, I, and I've always believed in this, this, uh, this saying, it's always the men and women and the denim the blue collar workers that built this country and they will always be there to fix the country, but it's always the amount of suits that do more damage to this country because they're only in it for profits. They're only in it for power or only in it for control. See, and that's the difference between capitalism and free market, right? When you have business people that destroy businesses because of their own personal gain, their profit, Mm -hmm. And it's not a free market. Right. That's capitalism. That's I'm going to suck every dollar I can out of you for the crappiest product that you're going to have to repurchase. 
and you're going to do it and you're going to like it, you know, because one of the things that we we will have a discussion about is, you know, they, they talk about bringing the manufacturing back. Well, that, that's not really all that realistic, is it? Now, car manufacturing, sure, I understand that. U.S. steel workers, yes, I understand that. But when they're talking about, like, all of the things that we've shipped to China, like the plastics and all of the uh, um, textiles, it's too expensive to try and bring that back now. But here's the solution. We can come up with better things. Mm. Plastic is bullshit. It's not necessary. We're wasting our time. So in Illinois, for example, (laughs) you have all kinds of wineries and breweries. Guess what they can't do? They cannot reuse the bottles. Now, when you and I were growing up, you got that eight pack of Pepsi, man. When it was done, you brought it back to the Jewel Osco and you got a quarter. Right. So your parents would be like, that's your allowance. You can take all 10 of them back and there you go. Two bucks, you know, or four bucks. So, you know, we're going to start putting those things back in motion. Yep. If we don't, if, if you're going to get a, a refund on buying your milk and glass, buying your sodas and glass water, you, you it comes out of your faucet. Right. We waste so much money on these plastics and the plastics get crappier and crappier every year an original water bottle was solid you could use that thing for probably about six or eight months now you get a plastic bottle of water it's like paper thin so there's no quality left in anything the cheaper they can make it the more they can push out it creates all this greed so if we start setting a standard of quality that we expect in america we're gonna have a better quality of life Right. Exactly. So we create new industries, which means that we build the workforce, right? Going back to the educational plan, we start defining these things now. And then we start getting all of the feedback from where we see in the past that we really screwed things up. Yep. Yeah. It created a short benefit for everybody. But then guess what? Then it turned into a disaster. Now it's polluting our oceans. And, you know, it's it's causing all these problems. There's trash in everybody's yard. It blows down the road. Respect your country, right? Have some have some expectations, man. And that's one of the things that we really need to focus on bringing back, right, is the pride in being American. So all these companies that have shipped everything over there and then just to ship it back. No, no, no. Like, we're just not going to do that anymore. We're going to bring the important things back and we're going to focus on innovation and we're going to focus on building our country into the strongest and most innovative nation in the world. People are going to be happy. They're going to be happy, right? Because you're going to have to worry about all of these overheads, right? Now it's like the insurance payment and then you got a co-payment, then you got a deductible and then you got your medication deductible and blah, blah, blah. I mean, come on, you know, How do you enjoy anything if you're constantly having to nickel and dime yourself when you're making $200,000 a year and you're living paycheck to paycheck? Something doesn't seem right about those numbers. You should be able to do almost anything you want with $200,000. And today, you really can't. You have to be very cautious because one screw up can cost you everything. It's all going to topple down. You can't build a solid foundation anymore because they criminalize everything. They rob you of your money. They give you cheap, crappy shit, and nobody's got a good attitude. How many people have a good attitude today? <laughs> Not many. You know, they're all struggling, and, and it doesn't have to be that way. And, I mean, I'll, I'll say this one more time, but it goes back to $300 billion. They sent over to Ukraine. That's right. Yeah. So we need to take some time to fix America, and we've yeah. got the money. We've got the resources. We got the people. Let's pull it together and let's do it. Let's solve these problems. And then we'll have a Congress that talks to their people because they're going to have time. They're not going to be career politicians. And we have a solid standing in education, healthcare. And I, I'm not a big proponent of the whole green thing because my research, and I'm not a scientist, but my research has told me. This is something that happens over and over in cycles on the planet. 
yes, we will work on mitigating these things just to make sure that your guys are all cool with it. So we'll come up with solutions to pollution and damaging our planet and taking down rainforests. I don't agree with any of that stuff. I don't think it's okay. But I don't think it has nearly as big of an impact on global warming like they think it does. Right? Because if you're talking two degrees over 100 years, come on, man. It's like you you run at 98.6 unless you're out jogging. Then you're at 99. Are, are you now causing greenhouse <laughs> gases? Or you, what, what's the deal? Right? So, you know, you got to have common sense. You know, and that's another thing, too, is that when we have government-paid scientists, these people will say whatever it is to push whatever narrative the government wants to push. When we have scientists that are independent, and they're coming out, you know, four or five of them, they've all done the same research, same studies and everything, and they're all coming out saying the same thing, and they're being criminalized because they're the top leading people in their field just because they don't agree with the government scientists you know um yeah i think that's got to change that's got to completely change we need to get back to the 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 honor system where you know you, you got some doctor out there that's you know trying to cure cancer and he finds a cure for it you know, and you've got scientific community that is, you know, repeating the same experiment and they're all coming out with the same results. I think that person should be a uh, herald. I think he should be, you know, put right at the front line. I think all of his work should be put into place to to, to make life, uh, the quality of life much, much better. Um and I, and I, I personally believe I, this is just this me as an independent, but I think the federal government should be extremely small, you know, and, and this would allow a lot more innovations. Uh, no, you know, with hardly any regulations. I think a lot of three letter agencies need to be either absorbed into the military or just, uh, you know, non-existent, right? I mean, every state has their way of doing certain things. And, you know, I like the idea that if I don't like this state, I can move to another state, you know. But when I've got a federal government trying to tell me uh, this, we're going to criminalize, if we're going to say, for example, uh, we're going to cr criminalize, uh, you know, on the cure of cancer. Well, I really don't have any other option because I can't just go to another state because the it affects that state too and so and the idea of me moving to canada or to mexico i mean that's i mean i'm an american first and foremost you know i serve my country there's no way in hell i'm gonna move out of my country you know just to go get what no. i need why should i i should be able just to get services or you know some you know it's like the whole medbed technology it's there it's been proven it works why don't we have it? Well, that's because of pharmaceutical industries, you know, and it all kind of goes back to what you're saying, you know, and this is, the, I think this is one reason why I'm going to throw my weight behind uh, the United Party, because I believe in the, in, in the, in the principles of it. And those principles pretty much reflect very, very much of what the constitutional, what the constitution says, the Bill of Rights, and even so much more to what the founding fathers, uh, what they had, uh, their vision, their vision for America was at that time. So, but hey, that's all we got for today, guys. Thank you for watching. Uh, thank you, Jason, for joining us today. And uh, we're going to be coming back on with some more episodes with Jason. And we're going to be talking about uh, other topics and on other uh you know issues that we're we're dealing with here in america today and uh we'll be uh looking forward to uh getting jason's thoughts on a lot of the stuff and and how can the you how can the united party uh be our saving grace in the days to come thank you. you you're welcome and if you got any any uh, a final thought for for the show for the viewers I think really what I want to say is I need everybody to consider this. And the United Party is really going to help 
reform our nation by the people for the people. So it's important that you look at everything we talk about objectively, not from your opinion, but about the resolution to the problems, because that's what we're here for is to resolve the problems. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. And thank you guys for watching. And just remember, stay blessed.